few weeks ago, I had preached a message on the prodigal son, and uh, the first week I had looked at the father, because it was around Father's Day, and then the next week I did a similar message, but looked at the perspective of the prodigal or the wasteful son, and then I sort of set it to the side because uh, the 4th of July was that week, and so we uh, looked at Independence Day, and last week was our feet washing ceremony, so I wanted to do something appropriate for that, but I didn't want to leave the prodigal son before we looked at all three of the main characters in it, and that's what we'll do this morning. We'll finish that up by looking at the good son, we'll call him that and I use air quotes on that and you'll see why very soon. Uh, he thought he was good anyway. And so this morning we'll just read the last part of that parable. The parable of the prodigal son is very familiar to most people so I don't think we have to go back to verse 11 but we'll just start at verse 25 and um, <laughs> I get the sense a lot of people might think that the parable ends in verse 24, but it doesn't. Uh, it goes from 25 up to verse 32. So if you are following in your pew Bibles, you'll find it on page 740. And again, this is in uh, Luke 15, beginning at verse 25, the word of the Lord says, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me, gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The Lord's blessing be added to the reading and to the hearing of his holy word. So today we're looking at this from the perspective of the older son. Again, he calls, he would probably call himself the good son. He was the one who couldn't see his own flaws. So, but before we get into this, I just want to illustrate this with an Old Testament example to show that um, this can happen to anyone. Uh, if we go back to David, King David, if you remember the story about uh, him and Bathsheba, this was a story where she was married to a man named Uriah, and David had relations with Bathsheba while she was married. Uh, she conceived a child. So David thought, I have to get rid of Uriah. So he put Uriah on the front lines of battle. And Uriah was killed. So David is in essence a murderer to cover up his infidelity. What he did was very despicable. So God sends the prophet Nathan to confront David, but he doesn't come right out and tell David, I know what you did, and now you're going to have to bear the consequences. Instead, Nathan tells David a story about characters that represent David and Uriah. And when David is repulsed at what these characters in the story uh, do to each other, Nathan then drops the bomb and tells David, you are the man. Sometimes we refuse to see our own flaws until we see them in others. Remember now that when Jesus in Luke 15 is telling these parables, he's mostly telling them to the Pharisees and he's using these stories to illustrate to them their self-righteousness. He's thinking maybe if they see 
this in other characters, then they will see it in themselves. So, when I thought about how to do this this morning, I could tell you about the older son, and but I thought it would be a lot more meaningful to show him to you. And what I mean by that is I have created what I think would be a first-person telling of this story from the perspective of the older son. I sort of think if he were sitting or standing here in front of you, he might say these things to you. And as you hear it, try to see how uh, the Pharisees, uh, their attitude comes out in this older son because that is who he represents. And it goes like this. I'm sure by now you've all heard about my brother who returned home. He's the foolish one who left years ago and now he crawls back with nothing more than the shirt on his back. And you know, I just don't get it. I, I don't understand why they make him out to be some kind of a hero. I don't want to sound childish about it, but really, it's not fair. Here I've been day in and day out, week after week, year after year, doing exactly what was expected of me, working my tail off, never once complaining about it. And what do I get for it? Did my dad ever throw me a party for me and my friends? No way. I guess he figures that I'll just hang around here no matter how he treats me, and he's betting on the fact that I won't run off like my brother did. So in the meantime, he'll just take advantage of me and my good heart. Some people may, sound, may say this sounds a bit resentful, but is there anything wrong with wanting what is rightfully mine? I don't think that's a lot to ask, but I really don't want to make this about me. It's really about my brother, that lazy, irresponsible, prodigal brother of mine and the way everyone is treating him, fawning over him now that he's home. If I didn't know any better, I'd think he was the one who stayed at home all these years and did everything that he should have done, the one who worked for dad while the other one ran off and had a grand old time. But here I am, where I've always been doing what I've always been doing, and I get the sense from everyone that I'm just supposed to sit back and put on a happy face for that good-for-nothing brat. Why in the world would I do that? I'm not the one who demanded my inheritance at such a young age. I'm not the one who wasted all that money and now have nothing to show for it. And does anyone even realize what exactly my brother did? Does anyone realize that when you demand your inheritance before the old, while the old man is still alive, it means you wish he was dead? That's all there is to it. When you do that, you are telling the world that the money means more to you now than enjoying time with him. I would never do that, but that's what my brother did, and it looks like now that all the money is gone, and now he comes back to dear old dad. And speaking of dad, I don't understand him. You see, if you act like a doormat for everybody, that's what they'll take you for, just a doormat. And they won't give you any respect either. And who's to say that my brother isn't going to run off again and do just like he did before? The leopards don't change their spots, now do they? Isn't that what they say? Why doesn't Dad see this? Why doesn't he see that people don't change? Once a prodigal, always a prodigal. That's what I say. And I'm starting now to see that Dad doesn't see a lot of things either, like how I've religiously worked for him day after day. Yet I seem to get nothing. Well, here's a thought. How about I walk into his room right now and demand my inheritance? Maybe then he'll realize how much he needs me. Maybe that's my ticket. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Now, isn't that what they say also? 
If, if my brother can go and live it up on dad's dime, why not me? Maybe then I'd be able to enjoy a little bit of what I've been working for all these years. Why wait for my inheritance? My brother didn't. I'm sure you can tell that I'm a bit frustrated by this. And at first, whenever my brother left, I actually felt a little sorry for dad. I really did. I'm sure that what my brother did was very hurtful to him, but I looked on the bright side, and I thought that through my hard work ethic, I could cheer up Dad, and he could at least take solace in the fact that I hung around to help the family business. He can be thankful that he has at least one son who's doing the right thing and who's working for what is rightfully his. Now, when I talk to Dad about this, he tells me that I'm going to inherit all this one day, but that's not the point. The point is, how can I be sure that I can rightfully get what is mine in the end? The last thing that I want is for uh, all the money to be spent before, before it's time for my inheritance. And in the meantime, I've been going above and beyond the call of duty, and I don't want to find out in the end that there's nothing left for me. Wouldn't that be a surprise? I mean, whenever my brother went and ran off, he wasted more money than most people here could shake a stick at. If we had that money that he had wasted, I just imagine how we could have invested that, and by the time Dad dies, they could probably double in value. But no, he was the one who had to be selfish. Did he ever think of me when he was out carousing and drinking and spending time with the prostitutes and the women? I'm sure he didn't. And you know, someone said that after he wasted the inheritance, my brother was found starving in a pig pen. Well, serves him right, as far as I'm concerned. If not for Dad, he'd have nothing. So, my brother goes from swapping around in a pig pen to wearing the family robe and a nice ring on his finger, as if nothing ever happened. Now, how fair is that? I still remember the day that I was slaving in the field. Have you ever been working and you hear something in the distance that sort of sounds out of place? and you're not sure exactly what it is because you're trying to think in your mind about all the possibilities. So I went closer to the house to see what was up and I heard this music and it was playing and I then called for a servant because there was no reason that music should be playing at this hour. And the servant tells me your brother uh, Cain has come home and your father has killed the fattened calf because he is safe and sound. Honestly, at first, I didn't even know what the servant meant when he said my brother. I mean, really, he had been gone so long, I'd pretty much forgotten about him. I guess I got used to Dad searching for him every day, looking for any sign of him in the distance, that it really became old hat. Me, I wasn't really concerned. Without him around, at least I knew that what what was mine was mine, and I didn't have to worry about him taking even more of it, like I do now. I'll tell you, when the servant filled me in on what was happening, I dropped everything and made a beeline straight to Dad. I cannot tell you how angry I was. And you know what? When I found Dad, he was practically giddy. He was ordering servants to stop whatever they were doing and to decorate and prepare for a party. Can you believe it? A party. I heard him say, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And what's even worse is that I can guarantee you that he's going to have my brother sitting next to him at temple next week, right next to him, beaming because my brother couldn't make it on his own, gloating to everyone that his family is now back together. You know, sometimes I can only stomach so much. And I hope he doesn't stand up and actually thank God publicly for bringing his son back to him. If he does so, I may have to get up and leave. Now, 
I try to be understanding, but can we have a little bit of perspective, please? No sooner does my brother walk through the door and Dad forgets everything he did to him. He forgets how he treated him and sometimes I wonder, is my dad mistaking my brother for me when he threw that party? I couldn't take it anymore, so I had to go and confront Dad about the party and the fattened calf. And all he did was make excuses for my brother. Speaking of the fattened calf, maybe he actually got the better end of this bargain because at least he doesn't have to listen to this nonsense anymore like I do. He's at least out of his misery, but I have to put up with this. Then Dad tried to make me feel like I wasn't being stabbed in the back by saying, and I'll never forget his words, he said, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. Oh, really? Is all that money that was wasted on this party mine? Is all that money that my brother wasted when he ran off mine? I don't think so. And you know, I don't know what hurts more. Is it how everything that should be mine is wasted or how patronizing he is? because Dad actually called me my son, as if now I'm part of a family. And, you know, it sounds a bit harsh, but you may, you may think it's harsh, but if you were in my shoes, I'm sure you'd feel the same way. You'd feel that way if all of your years of hard labor weren't recognized at all, and if your father throws a party for your loser brother, what gives you nothing but some promise for the future. And the more I think of it, isn't it rather obvious that Dad doesn't appreciate all this work I've been doing? I've been going above and beyond the call of duty, working alongside our servants when I don't have to. You know why I do it? I could be sitting at home right now and hire another servant in my place, but I want to save that money so I will have it later on in life. What I just don't get is he tells me that he's going to give me this inheritance whenever time comes, regardless of what I do. First thing I thought of when he said that was that the old man's crazy. But seriously, I had to set him straight, and I told him I'm going to earn every dime myself. I'm not like my brother who accepted this free offer from Dad whenever he gave him this inheritance that he didn't earn. And you know what? If that's how Dad wants to be, maybe I don't want his inheritance. When you get right down for it, I think that a real man is going to work for what is his and earn everything he has. It's only weakness that accepts something from someone that he didn't earn. That's not the way I roll. I am a self-made man and I don't think I need it. I can get along just fine. It's been like this for years now and I think it's about time that Dad knows how I really feel. And sometimes I feel like what I do is never enough. And I really think Dad has this complex where he has to constantly be giving people things that they don't deserve. He always has to be so gracious. Yeah, that's the word, gracious. Now, it's ironic that he says, you didn't earn this, and you hated me, and you called on me only when you needed me, and you didn't earn any of this, but I want to give it to you anyway, just to show you what a good guy I am, to show you how gracious that I am. Well, that's not the world we live in, now is it? And you know what I'd do? If I were in Dad's shoes, I'd make my brother work for it. I'd make him start out on the bottom like I did and work my way up and prove that he is worthy to be reinstated back into this family. That's what I would do. How is he going to learn from this if there are no consequences for his actions? And the more I talk about it, what it really boils down to is justice. Where is the justice in restoring my brother to a position that's better than before he ran off? It's not justice at all, and I think that's what's wrong with the world today. People who mess up need to get what they deserve. My brother doesn't deserve all that Dad is doing for him, 
and I don't think I will ever get over that. I'm glad I'm not like my brother. And it reminds me of a quick story that just the other day I went to the temple to pray like I should and to do my duty and to give my tithe, which, by the way, I count out to the exact penny. And you know who I saw there? I couldn't believe it when I saw a tax collector there in the temple. And he was actually praying the nerve of a tax collector. Of all the people to darken the doorway of a holy place, he had no right being there with him being a tax collector. So what I did is I sat down right next to him and I prayed so loudly I was sure he could hear. And I said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give one-tenth of all I get. And when I was done, I got to tell you how good I felt. And I pray that, that same thing about my brother. I'm so glad I'm not like him either. I've taken up enough of your time this morning, so let me just ask a question. Who would you rather be like? My brother who lived a terrible, sinful life and who wasted everything he ever had, or would you rather be like me? like the one who knew that he was working towards the goal all his life and always did what he should. Would you rather rely on the graciousness of another person like my brother does? Or would you rather take pride in working towards your inheritance like I do? I think the choice is an easy one. I've made my choice and now it's time for you to make yours. Switching back to me now, not speaking as the older son, I hope that you get a sense of how the Pharisees acted in regards to salvation, which is the point Jesus was driving home. You simply cannot earn salvation, which is what the older son called inheritance, but the Pharisees were the ones who were trying their best to do just that. And the disdain that this older son felt towards his brother was fueled by his own self-righteousness, his own sense of self-worth, where the Bible clearly tells us that our best works are like filthy rags, yet the older son in this story puts his on display for everyone to see. I think it's easy for us to see them what, for what they are, which is filthy rags. Let's not model that attitude. Let's all be humble and accepting of the gift that God offers to us, which is salvation through Jesus Christ. And when we humbly accept that gift, we then appreciate the giver of that gift even more. Also, in telling this from the older son's perspective, he stumbles upon a truth that I do want to draw attention to, and that is that what the father did for the younger son is not justice. He was right about that. What the father did was gracious. These are two completely different concepts. Justice is giving someone what they deserve, while graciousness is giving someone what they do not deserve. If a judge in a court of law throws a book at a criminal and gives him a sentence in accordance with the law, he has administered justice. But if the governor goes and grants a pardon to that same criminal, he has administered grace. <coughs> because he deserves something worse than what he endured. Since we are all born into sin, if God gave us justice as he promised, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, where he said, But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. We would all be dead. But if we accept God's offer of grace, which God <coughs> illustrates one chapter later in Genesis 3:15 where he says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel, which is a uh, allusion to the coming Messiah. Then we will have life everlasting if we accept that grace. One last thing is that I intentionally put 
some irony in this narrative of the older son because he's asking for justice. Does anyone really, truly want justice? Do you actually want to be paid for what you've earned? And the flip side being, do you want to suffer the consequences for the things you've done? I don't want justice. I'm perfectly happy with grace because I know that's the only way that we can change, which is through the blood of Jesus Christ, which is the most gracious gift of all. When you ask for justice, just remember that the old saying is true. Be careful what you wish for, because you just may get it. Let us now bow our heads and pray.